Shalom, everyone. Well, it's a delight to be here with Ben Jacobs for the second installment of our continuing education, Press Freedoms Under Siege. And this has been an attempt to really tease out in this uh, particular era um, what sort of things do we understand our tradition, our Jewish tradition to say, and how does it speak to this moment specifically in regard to First Amendment rights. Um, but also, we've had a chance to call on four individuals, this is our second, to speak from their own perspective as Jews and as those connected to this congregation about uh, how their Jewishness informs their work in journalism or their connection to the media. So a brief introduction to uh, a man who was on this BIMA 20 years ago this year, uh, uh, is, is it the last time you were on the? I've been on the Bema since the, then. I mean, I don't think, I don't think it's. He's been on the Bema since then. I just don't think it's the last time I've done an extended speech. Right. Well, everyone threw candy at you then. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we'll see what they throw at me today. <laughs> we can hope. We can hope. Uh, so Ben Jacobs is a political reporter for The Guardian, and he has also written for The Daily Beast. Uh, as I mentioned, he grew up here at Betham and comes back to be with his parents, Jim and Hillary Jacobs. Jim, a past president of Betham, and Hillary does pretty much everything else. Um, and we, uh, we know that you're Shepi Nachas, uh, looking up at your son here on the Bima, and many of us who have been following your career, Ben, certainly are very proud of the good work that you're doing. You know, so normally I save the gifts for the end, but I thought maybe I would actually start just, oops, just so you're prepared for the game tomorrow. I know you're going to the Ravens game, so this is for you. Um, it's a glasses case. Um, <laughs> And uh, also some like uh, glasses holders, and they're all they're all branded with the Ravens. So <laughs> you, should, <laughs> you should enjoy that, and I hope you'll use it in good health. Um, all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start with some some questions. Uh, we'll do that for a little while, and then we'd like to open it up for questions from the congregation as well. Um, but Ben, I'm I'm gonna start actually with a question that I also asked. David Simon when he was here, uh, which is, we titled this Press Freedoms Under Siege. Uh, he felt that the president's calling the press the enemy of the American people indicated that, in fact, press freedoms were under siege. And his assessment was that uh, the only thing really standing in the way of of um, true tyranny or, or autocracy is that we have an autocrat who's not particularly good at that, at that job, uh, that he's sort of a failing autocrat, and so press freedoms are maybe uh, safe or somewhat safe because of the incompetence in the office. I'd like to hear sort of your thought, not necessarily on, on uh, exactly that, but what do you think about the state of journalism in America today and, and our press freedoms? Are they secure, are they not? The, yeah, the state of journalism in America today is, is great, and there's great journalism being done from a lot of outlets. Outlets are actually doing... It's, it's on, just it's on? you have to kind of angle it. To okay, it how's this? Okay. So yeah, the state of journalism, you know, outlets are doing better than they have in the past. Um, there's great journalism being done. And the fact that the president tweets about fake news or enemy of the people doesn't necessarily undermine the state of journalism. It's not as if there's press censorship. We're not an autocracy, that there's sort of something separating the rhetoric from the actual actions. So that there's concern in terms of the level of trust in sort of weaponizing distrust of journalism into something that undermines reporting and the sort of creation in some places and it's happening much more on the right but also in some in some some aspects a little bit on the left of sort of alternate realities that people can fully inhabit without uh, without actually interacting with you know real reporting and objective truth I mean that's sort of the issue it's not so much that Donald Trump's going to show up at the New York Times at the head of you know the 82nd Airborne. I mean that's that's not something that's going to happen, or anybody should be worried about. It's it's just a level of how divided the news environment gets. 
particularly in an era when there's more and more outlets uh, that are sort of creating that there's not one mainstream media anymore, if you want to use that term, that it's not three networks, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, that you now have a whole diversity of outlets, which brings some, certainly brings some benefits, but has some downsides as well. But do you feel that the, the American people uh, have an appreciation for the distinction between these type of media outlets? I mean, when you've got the president who's conflating Breitbart or some of the even more extreme outlets with uh, mainstream news agencies like The Guardian or like NBC or like CNN um, and calling the, you know, the former news and the latter fake news, I mean, uh, are Americans believing that? And what does that mean I, I, about I, the credibility that's, of journalism? That's, that's a concern because it does. It's the creation of these alternate realities. And you remember, the creation of these alternate realities. Um, I had better sound last time I was up here. It might be, you want to switch mics? We could try it. Sure. How's this? Is that a little better? Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's just trying to make himself look good. Um, no, but the creation of these sort of alternate realities and alternate universe. And remember, fake news, the term was created last year to describe these actually fake stories on Facebook about, uh, you know, whatever sort of crazy insanity that Hillary was conspiring with the Freemasons to, you know, blow up the state of Wyoming or something. That this is not, this has been termed to describe actual reporting that the president turned to actual reporting doesn't like. And that's sort of the question and that sort of creating this alternate reality, which is happening with folks. And folks do it for political gain. I mean, folks go after news outlets for reasons all the time, but the fact that it's in part of such a coherent worldview and a coherent attempt to undermine the credibility of journalism because and create at least a strong portion of the population that distrusts, for example, in Alabama, the uh, that uh, Roy Moore is now running against the Washington Post um, instead of creating that atmosphere and trying to deal with those allegations that way. That's, that's sort of the issue. So um, I know you donated your glasses to the, the other ones, the broken ones, to the museum, which I thought was a nice touch. And um, at the museum, there is this map of press freedoms around the world, and you feel like we're firmly in the green, I'm, we're okay, we're, we're firmly, but maybe some things to pay attention yeah, to. I mean, I think we're okay in terms of press freedoms. And I would note the glasses was sort of, they asked me for my broken glasses and what the hell else was I going to do with them? Like, <laughs> I'd like throw them away, you know, someone can get some use out of them. So I'm sure they're there dipped in gold or however they have them. But yeah, I think we're firmly, in the, I think it's a question about how people view the news and how people view that it's sort of the th threats to press freedom are, are uh, postmodern rather than, uh, than concrete. I see. Um, may, may, you know, Halavaya should continue to be that way. Um, so speaking a little bit about that experience uh, that led to your broken glasses, and I know you're a little uncomfortable talking about this because you don't love being the news, you mm -hmm. prefer actually reporting the news, um, but I hope it's okay to ask you a little bit about sure. that experience. Um, you're on record describing what happened, but maybe you could talk a little bit here about you know what actually transpired and what you what you learned from that incident with then Canada and Gian, Gianforte. Uh, it just was, I went to ask him a question that they, were, the campaign was being weird. The knock on Gianforte, from all my reporting before this all happened, was that he was not the nicest human being. Um, I. I feel like that, that reporting probably bore out pretty well. You know, and to ask him a question, starts grabbing my phone and grabs me, and then, you know, it's, I mean, I'm sure everyone here has heard the audio, you know, grabs me by the neck and throws me down and jumps on my back and starts hitting me, um, which is very, very strange. I mean, those are, that's not normal, and suddenly realizing, you know, broke my glasses, like, I've Landed on my elbow, ended up going to the hospital and getting x rayed and because I landed on my elbow on the floor. And it, it was just strange. It's not normal. That's, those are the type of interactions I feel, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, it was 
peculiar and the response, I mean, the entire thing was bizarre and it happens. He committed to doing an interview with you. Yeah. Has he done that yet? No. And uh -huh. And do you have any, and he's not going to do it no, even though. Because, and that's, that's been the issue that he's been very weak. So when it all happened, this was apparently a plot by the liberal media. Mm -hmm. This was me trying to create a create something and somehow uh, create a violent altercation to make him look bad because that's really, you know, I've spent my entire career waiting to be a sleeper agent in a Montana special election. This is really what my entire life, I've been in deep cover for years. Just, it was a strange, um, and he's not really backed off that the one time he should have been clear about that is when he's been legally required to. And, you know, look, I can't, you know, not all of us can be body slammed by good people. So Elliot Nelson wrote the following in the Huffington Post recently. In the last 12 months, Sebastian Gorka, a man with ties to Hungarian fascists and whose White House tenure could charitably be described as an utter disaster, landed a Fox News contributing gig. Sean Spicer enjoyed a soft landing with a teaching gig at Harvard and a cameo on the Emmys after an institution damaging tenure as White House press secretary. And Greg Gianforte won a seat in Congress after being arrested for assaulting a reporter. Ben, what do you think it says about America right now that a candidate you mentioned in Roy Moore uh, can potentially win an election having assaulted uh, teenagers, assaulted. right? Right. So, so allegedly assaulted uh, multiple teenagers, and uh, but but I think you uh, could say uh, Greg Gianforte. I think it was fairly clear he was guilty of what he did, um, and go on to win a uh, high government office. Uh, what do you, what is this about? What's well, going I mean, on? Gianforte already won. Right. Um, no, but when it happened that. Most votes in Montana are absentee, and about 70% of the ballots have been in anyway, so mm -hmm. he had already won. Um, but in terms of you know, the, those, those issues, those are all complicated things, and Gorka, I mean, Gorka's job in the White House was just to go on Fox News and then sit around drinking coffee until his next TV hit, but that's a continuation. Um, and look, there's an interesting thing with how voters Weigh, weigh these charges and weigh, weigh these allegations. And what's been sort of striking for me with Roy Moore having been in Alabama and going back to Alabama, that his fight is not really the allegations, that it's sort of trying to improve, it going after the women accusing him and going after the accuracy there, that it's, that's what's interesting. And that's sort of the challenge now, that he's not going after, he's not providing an alternate story. He's just saying everything there is fake news. Right. That doesn't give me a, a lot of comfort. Um, so moving on to another, uh, another man and politician um, that you spent a, a fair amount of time with in now President Donald Trump. Yep. You were covering him, uh, working for The Guardian, traveling around, covering his campaign. And I'm wondering... Um, what that was like, maybe what were some takeaways from that experience, uh, and, and have you seen a change in his approach to the media between candidate Trump and now President Trump? Yes, uh, that was... <laughs> Just speak up a little okay. bit. You know, it's, when you come back to Beth Amben, you know, people are going to tell you what they think. It's not, they're I, I not going to sit around yeah. and so... They can't hear you. They're going to tell. We're, we're, we are tr planning to replace our audio system as part of this capital campaign. So if so, this inspires you to participate uh, or more fully than you already have, just one example of the importance of having a really good audio system in here. But, you, but thanks for speaking that. I was going to make the fundraising pitch myself before you did it. Oh, no. Oh, oh no. Fine. Do it again. It's <laughs> give, to, give, to, give to Beth Thom so you can hear me or alternately give to Beth Thom so you don't have to hear me. How about that? <laughs> All right, wait, but you were going to talk about Donald Trump candidate and what, you've, uh, what you learned. Uh, two years with Donald Trump was a cultural experience. Um, but it was sort of very interesting that Trump, of course, has changed that from at the beginning he was super accessible. I mean, this was a guy who 
had been on the phone with the New York tabloids day in and day out for decades, and that, that gradually changed as he sort of became a front runner, and uh, there is a level of constantly churning controversy that never went away and sort of kept on being accelerated. It was sort of strange because there was always something new and something more, but it was never, you know, it was interesting that it's, uh, it's sort of like, uh, there's, there's a great piece by Leon Wolf, uh, Red State from about two years ago after a Trump event in Dubuque, where he sort of compared it to an airplane putting out chaff, that there's so much you can't really focus on one, that there's so much sort of floating around, and that's what happens. And we've seen that this week, you know, even going on, for example, that you can run through the events of the week, you know, that it's hard to remember that it was five days ago that he uh, went after Elizabeth Warren's heritage at an event for Navajo Code Talkers, and sort of whatever your views on Elizabeth Warren are, whether she used her ancestry to any sort of unfair advantage, making a comment like that at an event to honor heroic World War II veterans is not par for the course. On through the morning of tweets ranging from bigoted anti-Muslim videos to, you know, to the more mundane tweets where he just accused Joe Scarborough of murder. Um, I didn't see that one. You got you to pay more, you got to get the alerts on him. But that's the thing, but that it's sort of the type of thing where any one of these, if George Bush or Bill Clinton or Obama or Jimmy Carter going back, you know, Warren G. Harding or James Madison, people would be flabbergasted, but the fact that there's so many of them and in such such order that that's sort of the way taking advantage of the fact that the media that the keyword in news is new and that there always has to be something new and sort of what someone pointed out today with the uh, tax bill that passed the Senate overnight is that we still don't have a terribly clear idea of, I mean, we have a pretty clear idea, but we don't have a precise idea of how this affects the president because he is yet to release his tax returns because the audit is still ongoing. I'm sure they'll wrap it up soon. By the way, I think Andrew Jackson was a tweeter. Uh, he, 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 um, but um, <laughs> also wasn't a fan of Navajo Indians. Um, so I want to ask about um, your Jewishness. And uh, y you mentioned the, the liberal media and some of the comments that it made around your experience with Gianforte, and I don't know if you were implying, but certainly I think in certain circles, and it seems increasing uh, concentric circles, there are those who express those words or hear those words as the liberal Jewish media. I'm wondering um, how your experience as a Jewish reporter, or as a reporter who happens to be Jewish, um, has that been changed in this era uh, of the rise of white supremacy? Do people say things, tweet things, troll you? Sure, though I would, I, I mean, it's the rise of white supremacy, I feel like, is a little bit, I'm always hesitant because, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, 200, uh, 200 schmucks with torches isn't exactly a No, but the, the Anti-Defamation League and is on record I'm saying that incidents of anti-Semitism no, are significantly up, up no, from where they were a few years ago. Up, uh, you know, or like people sitting around in their parents' basements, uh, you know, writing anti-Semitic posts in between, you know, making Pop-Tarts. Um, but no, there's certainly been some of that. I've, I can, I mean, it's fine. Like, I haven't dealt with anywhere near as much as sort of certainly a number of my friends and... You know, that during the campaign that it happened a little bit. I mean, who, at this point, it's, I don't know any reporter who hasn't been photoshopped into a gas chamber yet. So it's, you know, you just sort of wave that stuff off because it's just some idiot on the internet. And, uh, and certainly after the Gianforte thing, there was, uh, there was some mild explicit stuff of apparent. There was a, a person for a right-wing magazine who praised the fact that Gianforte d did what I deserved in punching me in my hook nose which was, uh, you know, I didn't think he, I don't think I have a hook nose, but I don't think it was, I don't think it was trying to be accurate. There's, I still remember there's, my favorite thing was a letter to the editor in the Missoula paper uh, that said that this was, that compared Gianforte to Jesus because Jesus body slammed the money changers. Um, that, that 
wasn't also terribly subtle. But uh, I also don't think it was right. But you know, I'm not, I'm not that renowned a New Testament scholar, so I won't get into it. Um, well, I, I certainly applaud, you know, your your sense of self and your willingness to continue to go forward. I mean, I, I was speaking this morning about the culture of um, machismo and uh, what somebody was telling me, a term I hadn't heard before, of toxic masculinity um, that is really, I think, fairly pervasive and we're learning from the number of men who are being outed as, as having um, credible um, accusations from multiple sources of abuse or of harassment or rape. Um, you know, just as I would say, Ben, that it's not women's responsibility to make excuses for their attackers. Uh, um, it's not ours as Jews to make excuses. And, and, uh, and so I, I certainly know you're not doing that, um, but I, I, you know, I, I feel, um, you know, I, I'm mortified when I hear that you're being photoshopped into gas chambers. And I don't care who's doing it. I don't care if they're sitting in their basement. I don't care if they're, you know, on the evening news. Um, this can't stand, and this is not the country that we, um, you know, live in, and it shouldn't be, and we need to do more to make sure that it doesn't uh, continue to happen. So I'm sorry for those experiences yeah, that you've had, but um, uh, I, guess, I guess I can't brush them off maybe as easily it's, it's, as you it's do. Not, I mean, I, look, it's part of it, it's dealing with the fact that this is fringe weirdos, that if you're taking it seriously, they've, they've, they've won um, in the way that they're always you know, fringe weirdos for, you know, going back, I mean, you know, think about the, there's George Lincoln Rockwell in the American Nazi Party, and you know, the, the 10 guys who marched in Skokie, that it's the type of thing that they're more visible now because the internet makes it much more easy to be visible. And there's also, Nazis in America makes, makes a good story. It's a good press. People want to read about, you know, American national, so American Nazis is interesting. American, uh, you know, Christian Democrats or Flemish nationalists or whatever is not that terribly interesting, that Nazis are inherently very interesting um, and get attention and that they get a lot of coverage. I'm, I'm just, it's not me being dismissive, but sort of just having a sense that just sort of trying to put things in perspective. Yeah, I think what you're putting your finger on in a way is um, the you know, some of the technology that exists um, helps enable uh, one person to make a much broader impact um, than they were able to before. And I'm wondering um, uh, about that is, you know, to what extent is that the culture? Um, when we talked about Donald Trump earlier, uh, and you mentioned how frequently he was covered by tabloids and by the press, or some have argued that the media uh, in some ways help put him in the presidency because they gave him so much airtime. And I'm wondering if that's something you've heard as someone who's covering the president. How were stories about Trump received by news agencies versus stories about, about you know, somebody helping their neighbor shovel their walk? Uh, and, and should we be concerned when we're not covering, uh, you know, I mean, human interest stories in favor of something more salacious? Well, I mean, what you're describing as something more salacious is actions by the President of the United States. I mean, that's sort of the very definition of, you know, things that people cover. And I think there's sort of the weird reaction because we have a very unusual President of the United States right now um, and how to deal with someone who uh, behaves in ways that, uh, you know, are not necessarily normal. But, you know, someone shoveling their walk is not... No, but there are obviously more, I mean, I didn't give a good example, but there are, you know, I, I remember after the uprising here in Baltimore, um, uh, the next day, right, after the rioting, after the looting, there were, you know, hundreds, thousands of people out cleaning up neighborhoods. We were out cleaning up neighborhoods. I know a lot of you in the room were out cleaning up neighborhoods, many more than the folks who were destroying, and yet the coverage of that was so disproportionately small compared with the coverage of the rioting. And so I'm wondering, I guess I'm sort of shifting a little bit in my questioning, but is there a role or responsibility that news outlets have to lift up stories that are about, that are positive stories, uh, rather than 
fall prey to that sort of human instinct to want to hear the bad stuff. But I, I, I'm not even sure that's human instinct to want to hear the bad stuff, that people cleaning up a neighborhood happens all the time. Watching liquor stores get looted and pharmacies get set on fire. I mean, I, mean, I was in the middle of all the riots when it happened and was at, uh, yeah, I was at you know the corner of North and Fulton when they were looting a couple of liquor stores and still will remember to the rest of my life the shirtless guy double fisting pink champagne shouting no justice, no peace. Mm -hmm. That's pretty unusual. Um, and that it's not to diminish the fact that you know, covering these sorts of positive things is important, but that's also a follow-up. That's a next day story that's only happening as a result of the rioting and the looting and the destruction that happened the night before. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's sort of to be taken account with that specific example. I want to ask one more question about your Jewishness. Uh, you know, you grew up here at Beth Am. You, uh, um, you know, went into journalism. Uh, though I think you also went to law school. Yeah. Was right before that. And I'm curious uh, if your Jewishness, your own Jewish, you know, values, um, has informed that choice uh, to become a reporter. If so, how? If not. Um, you know, how did you how did you end up in the business? I mean, it was a variety of accidents that I got end up in journalism. It was uh, uh, the economy crashed, and I graduated from law school at, from Duke at a time when I think a third plus of my class was unemployed, and I had a random connection in journalism, and was fun. And one thing led to another, led to another, led to another, and I've uh, I've made it. Um, that I don't think that it informed my career choice, but in terms of approaching things and trying to, how to deal with people and how to be, you know, respectful and certainly to be aware of how to cover, cover issues, uh, that certainly has played an impact. I don't think it made any, the career choice was sort of serendipity. I don't even think it was a choice. It was a series of peculiar accidents, but certainly, of course, I'm sure it informs everything I do. Is there any specific example you could give us? I have to think of what a good example, what a good example would be. Um, I mean, I think just in general, in terms of everyday interaction, and trying to be decent with folks, that that's important. Sort of uh, makes makes a difference, and certainly trying to trying to take a better path. That certainly with the Montana thing, that I was made an effort specifically to try to make things better. Um, unfortunately, that process involved uh, cooperation, which wasn't forthcoming, but at least trying and trying to take the right road and do the right thing to make a difference in the world rather than you know, use it for attention grabbing or victimhood or make money off of a lawsuit. I mean, I have to say, I was very proud of the way that you handled that incident, and I, I thought you handled it with dignity and poise, um, and kept it about, you know, you kept it about the story, which is what great, you know, what great journalism is about. It's not easy when someone is sort of physically assaulting you uh, to do that, so call a vote to you for the way you handled that, and I know, I know, you know, talking to your, to your dad about it, he was very proud, your parents are very proud uh, also of the way that you, you handled that as, as, as all of us were. Um, we've talked a little bit about Twitter. I wanna ask maybe a couple more questions and then open it up. You retweeted this week, and I do follow you on Twitter. You have like 150,000, how many, like how many followers do you have? I can you pull up my phone and tell you. No, not on Shabbos. No, no. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's pretty impressive, actually. And I, I have to say, like, I'm, I'm not on Twitter enough for it to matter. So when I tweet things, like, two people like it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one person maybe retweets it if anybody. Because you have to, on Twitter, you have to be there. You really have to be there a certain volume in order to be... Plus, like, maybe people don't care about what I tweet the way they care about what you tweet. But, um, but I am curious. This is, this is something that you did retweet from Matt Pierce. Twitter is rotting my brain from the inside, yet it feels like the only thing fast enough to track the massive changes happening in the culture on an hour, hourly basis. So what is the role of Twitter? And particularly, what's the role of Twitter for a journalist? Well, First of all, you're assuming a retweet is an endorsement there. Which I was is not making assumptions. I was simply different. quoting you, sir. Um, you, you were, you were quoting, I was quoting your retweets, right? But this, this, is, this is exactly the point, right? Uh, 
but uh, but no, certainly because it is a very fast way, in sort of a way that it's sort of you know having an old-fashioned AP ticker tape on your phone, um, combined with all the other distracting and possibilities for stupidity. Uh, but it's it's both important and also kind of a sideshow at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, that Twitter is not the real world, it's a tool, but it also can be a very distracting distraction. Mm -hmm. But at a time, particularly the past week, where this has been, even by the standards of 2017, which has been a wacky year, this has been a wacky week, that there's sort of, you know, you step, you know, you step away to, you know, grab a sandwich and you look back at your desk and there's some, you know, someone else got fired for sexual harassment or something else crazy happened in Washington. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, it's hard to almost keep track of all the developments as they happen minute by minute, day by day. So let me ask you about uh, that. Uh, since, I, since this week's Parsha did include the rape of Dina and I talked about sexual violence earlier, um, um, Matt Lauer or, um, you know, or Charlie Rose or, you know, Garrison Keillor, I don't know if he counts as a journalist, I don't think so, but, um, but certainly, uh, and, and there are different levels of accusations, and, yep. and some of these are alleged, some of them, um, you know, obviously many of them have multiple alleged victims who have come forward, so there's, a, I think, a fair sense when we're not in a court of law of, of being able to reasonably assess um, you know, people's, people's behavior, um, even if we're not talking about convictions. But I'm curious, you know, what we're learning, whether it's NBC or other agencies, um, do you, you know, within the world of reporting, within journalists, um, is there a sense that uh, this is something that needs to be addressed from the inside out? Uh, are there sort of fundamental concerns about the way that that media outlets do do business? I, I don't think it's inherent to media outlets. I mean, it's inherent to society. And certainly what we've seen is media outlets do the best job of addressing this, that Matt Lauer doesn't have a job, Charlie Rose doesn't have a job, whereas folks in various under, other industries are still gainfully employed, including on, on Capitol Hill. Um, that media has dealt with it well, but I don't think it's unique to any industry. I think it's just for a variety of reasons that the media is sort of, first of all, there's no one who's more happy to leak to journalists than other journalists, which helps. But I think it should have dealt with this in a way that, not that it's by any means admirable, but been better and been quicker about it than, say, you could look through because this is something that happens on Wall Street as well as at the Wall Street Journal, or you know that it's, that it's just an industry where there's sort of a level of transparency and attention that it sort of happened at a faster uh, pace and in a more straightforward way. Um, do you think, I mean, why now? Maybe it's obvious, but I, uh, I mean, what, so obviously that, that was true of media outlets before, but, but Matt Lauer's been around for a while, Charlie Rose has been around for a while. Why, why now? It, it, it seems like uh, the Harvey Weinstein stuff really let the genie loose from the bottle. And some of this stuff, there were folks, not to get into namey names, I mean, that would be appropriate, but there was generally known that some of these people were less upstanding, um, but no one had ever pushed it through or reported through or ever sat down that it sort of everything, post Weinstein, sort of the genie left, left the bottle. I mean, mm -hmm. that there's, when you go to Kevin Spacey, I mean, there were jokes at award ceremonies about Kevin Spacey, but mm -hmm. no one, it just sort of changed, it did what was needed to sort of start a conversation that really needed to be had. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just have w one more question for you, and then I think we'll open it up. Um, you know, you, you've done pretty well for yourself, Ben, uh, from 20 years ago celebrating your bar mitzvah and the bima to uh, being a, a highly regarded uh, political reporter. Um, what, are your, what are your future aspirations? Where would you like to see yourself 20 years from now? Why are you letting my dad plan questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he asked five years. I'm, I'm asking 20, you know. I mean, 20 years from now, I guess it'll be, it'll be due to come up here and do another spiel from the bima, so. 
So you don't want to give in, like what, uh, give out a little bit of uh, uh, where you hope your career will go? Be moved back on. All right, fair enough. Um, uh, Better, better, better reporter than a subject, uh, or maybe the other way around. So let's open it up uh, to to questions for Ben, and just again, uh, if you could keep your questions in the form of questions, not speeches. And also, please recognize um, that you know uh, Ben is here. Uh, he he has a job. He has a job to do, um, and we want to be respectful of uh, his willingness to to make himself available to us today. Uh, yeah, please. And Rabbi Kelly is coming around, so. And speak, as we've learned, speak close to the microphone. Hi, Ben. Yes. Um, ben, back when I was a reporter, politicians generally tended not to lie. They did, but they didn't do it brazenly. We had to dig a lot to find out their lies. What do you do when you have people who come out every day and just out and out lie? Shouldn't you have a column that says, Everything said by this particular person is a lie. That's, that's, a, that's an issue that's been a struggle. Um, and we've certainly seen, I mean, I still remember the New York Times printing that, I guess it would have been then Canada Trump lied. That it's hard to, that part of the, I mean, it's a balancing act because you don't want to take away the power of that because if you keep on saying someone's lying all the time, then it becomes sort of noise. Um, that using it when it's important that there's a very good reporter named Daniel Dale who works for the Toronto Star who's just sort of obsessively tracks everything the president says and every time it's dishonest. But there's sort of a level of obsession there. And Daniel's a great guy and a great reporter. But, you know, the president said he got Hillary Clinton got 223 electoral votes instead of 232 or something, that what the issue is and where it's going, that you still sort of have to, have to hold on to that because, you know, having it up with, you know, every, every time when you have a political figure is prone to hyperbole, it's sort of being careful to call your shots because if you say that all the time, You're, it all sort of washes over. And having to be very specific, particular about when, when something pushes through and when to sort of take that out of the back pocket because it's important and try to make clear the difference between hyperbole and you know, an outright false statement, which in sort of on a meaningful material issue, which we've had quite a few of as well. Yeah, Stu. Yeah, I'd like to follow up your, your comment that Julie Moore is running against the Washington Post by asking you, because you're now covering uh, the election in Alabama, about the media climate in Alabama. I, I heard on the television that all of the major local newspapers in Alabama have declined to endorse Roy Moore and have endorsed his opponents. That, uh, you can tell me whether that's accurate. But I also, when I was channel surfing, uh, I've landed on a, one of the... Stu, so we're having a, a little I'm trouble uh, understanding you. Speak maybe okay. a little closer is it, is to the microphone. Is this better? Yeah. Right. Okay. We, we heard you were asking about Alabama. Okay. I'll, I'll start from yeah. the beginning. I don't want to take up precious time. I would like to follow up your comment about uh, Roy Moore running against the Washington Post, because you're covering that election now in Alabama. Uh, I heard on television that all of the local newspaper outlets in Alabama have endorsed his opponent. So there is local newspaper uh, opposition to him, and you can, you can verify that or not or qualify that. I also found when I was channel surfing, I landed on one of the right-wing channels that was covering a Roy Moore campaign appearance at a church, and it wasn't a coverage, it was the entire speech that went on for like an hour. So do you have comments about the media environment and how different media are affecting the election in different ways? I mean, I, the media environment matters. And you mentioned that the Alabama papers endorsed uh, the Democrat there. They also endorsed Hillary Clinton, and she, she didn't do well in Alabama. That there's sort of a level of what influence editorial boards have. And, these, and the things that these issues, I mean, the allegations against Roy Moore have made, made a big difference. And that as much of the issues now are the fact there are ideological issues there. 
Um, and the Roy Moore speech, I'm not sure which channel would have been showing Roy Moore's entire speech live in a church as someone who, uh, who probably watched that myself, um, that, uh, that the speeches, his events are uh, less exciting than Trump rallies is probably the best way to put it. Um, but that there's certainly the fact that folks are going that, I mean, I think the example of someone whose speeches were live all the time would have been the president's uh, during the campaign and how much of a difference that made. But there is sort of what the attention is given. And look, it's worth noting that the weirder things get, the more attention things people get. That part of the reason, for example, uh, Donald Trump or Roy Moore will get on is that there may be something interesting or outlandish rather than the detailed description of policy on entitlement spending. Um, and that, that makes a difference because people tend to want to watch, you know, that rather than detailed, detailed arguments about entitlement spending because if they wanted to watch the latter, C-SPAN would be the top rated network in the country. I watch C-SPAN a little. I wonder if you could comment on this. I go to a gym and working out, there are two TVs. And one is, one is on CNN, the other is on Fox News. And I'm watching this stuff and it just strikes me that there's, there's too much constant news there's too much continual news, and there's just not enough information, valid, useful, worthwhile, thoughtful information to justify all that time. And I wonder if we would be better off if there was not constant news where there's an event and the newscasters ask prominent people to comment on everything, whether that they don't have, which they don't have time to think about and whether it's, it's relevant or not. And I wonder if you could, what your thoughts are on that. I personally want there to be a lot less news. It would make my life much easier, much more relaxing. Um, look, I mean, there's sort of the churn of the 24-hour news cycle and what, how cable TV can drive things and certainly how now sort of with the internet things are being driven faster than that, that it's sort of change change their patterns of consumption in ways that probably raise questions but it's also hard to f figure out how you can you know suddenly make 20 cable news go away and go back to the days where there's you know a morning paper and an evening paper um that's that's probably uh probably difficult to do but yeah certainly I, i'm really hope for more slow news weeks me too yes I'm Lynn Kapiloff, and I'm a publisher. Hold it a little, Lynn, hold it a little closer about there. You go. Right. I'm Lynn Kapiloff, and I'm a publisher, and I agree completely with this. In the old days, you used to check the stories before they went out. Now, any, anybody can post anything on the web, and you can prove anything that you want to say anywhere. And whether it's true or not doesn't make any difference. What can we do to clean up the mess? I mean, I think. Outlets are doing as good a job as they've, they've done before, that just read good news outlets, be it the Times or the Post or the Wall Street Journal, or rather than some link that uh, Cousin Fred puts on his Facebook page. I mean, I think that's sort of the reference is that there's sort of, it's not that people are doing a worse job reporting the news, it's just that there's more stuff out there and that, you know, the chain the stuff that uh, once was chain emails 15 years ago is now Facebook posts or you know some creating a group that it's not that different. But can I ask a follow-up question on that? Because so Lynn, for example, she runs a, a sort of a regional paper, The Sentinel. Um, uh, there has been a, a downsizing of local news, and and you know you're covering national or international stories. Do you worry a little bit about yeah. how there aren't the resources that used to be invested in getting the news from City Hall or the news from Carroll County? Or that, I mean, that's a huge issue, which is something that, that there are now you know, fewer and fewer reporters at state houses or city halls or 
which is which is entirely sort of entirely sort of separate phenomena that part of it is sort of a cultural thing our tensions are more and more nationally focused that people are less engaged civically which means local engagement there's more obsession with the national story that you know every i think throughout my lifetime every president we've had has been pretty much a bigger personality after another and been got more attention to consume more of both parties and that there's a growing role of the administrate of uh of the executive branch and that sort of changes things and how things are covered mm -hmm. and also we've witnessed the collapse of advertising revenues that and what that means for local papers in particular that national nationally internationally it can be scaled in a way that is somewhat less disastrous but domestically on local markets i mean as someone who's read the baltimore sun since i was a kid you know it's doing having to do has less and less and sort of struggling and because it's harder to find a viable economic model to keep it keep it going and there there's something there there's still the demand there it's just how to how to turn that into you know something that you can make money off of great i would like to know yes. as a young person who works in an industry that's under siege that has the occasion to see some of the very worst of our fellow citizens, how do you keep your spirits up? Because those of us in the room have a very difficult time, and we're not even as close to it as you are. Um, I, it's, I, I, I'm always entertained by, by stuff. Um, and you know, when I'm not, there's, you know, there's have a cocktail or two, and then things are better. <laughs> But it's it's that I don't know if I I don't it doesn't seem that dire to me. I mean I'm also look I'm not a war correspondent I'm not you know covering Syria like I go to you know cover politics and go to political rallies and occasionally people you know boo and hiss at me but that's not nice but there are plenty of people who do far more important far better work than I am who are documenting war crimes and dodging bullets, that I'm sort of wary of taking, taking too much credit for things, that there are journalists being killed for doing their jobs across the world right now, you know, folks in Mexico and Russia, and like, you know, I just happen to deal, deal with some, you know, some, some jerk in Montana, like, it's not the end of the world, like, it's not the biggest, it's, you know, that I'm not, I'm not trying to dodge bullets from a cartel or deal with, you know, the Russian government trying to blow up my car. I think we have time for a, a couple more. Yeah, Jerry so in the ben, back, and then I think Elaine is waiting up front too. Okay. And Ben, yeah. um, I actually think you're a little too sanguine about the media not being under siege, and I guess I come at it a little bit more from a business perspective. I mean, there's two things going on. One is Sinclair Broadcasting, given ability to buy many, many, many stations, and clearly having a, a slant on the news, at least as bad, if not worse, than Fox. Plus, there's certainly media coverage that AT&T may be prevented from merging with Time Warner or forced to distribute, uh, offload CNN at its economic disadvantage to specifically attack that news outlet. So how do you reconcile those issues and do you think about that at all? I mean, I think there's sort of broader issues and sort of what's happening on local TV and local news I was, is its own complicated thing and uh, Sinclair has been a relatively unique phenomena um, in terms of the fact that they would put on uh, you know their segments with uh, with Boris Epstein uh, late of the White House who's not uh, I mean I think I think the, the the best word I can say is something I picked up in Alabama which is bless his heart um, <laughs> but uh, but with but with what you mentioned with Time Warner and CNN like that there's the issues there that it's it's funny watching uh, a, how the antitrust issue has been going along, and that's that's its own peculiar situation. But you know, on one hand, driven by what seems to be Trump's very particular interest obsession with CNN, but it's not. But it's not something that's sort of anything different that uh, 
the FCC would have probably waived these rules under any Republican president um, that it's interesting, the merger actually probably, the only issues would have come, the only other president who would have had issues with that merger for entirely different reasons would have been President Bernie Sanders. But it's sort of trying to separate what's normal and what's, or not normal, but what is within normal bounds, within sort of the wide goalposts and what's uh, more than one standard deviation beyond. Yes, Elaine. So this is sort of an I have a dream question. On behalf of those of us who miss Charlie Rose's interviews and Garrison Keillor's Writer's Almanac, and um, we can go on and on with some of the people who have been th tossed off in the last week or so, what do you think are the chances of getting a concentrated campaign to exchange those, uh, those people in exchange for a public apology by Donald Trump. <laughs> I, I, I'm not quite sure that that's something that's likely to happen. I'm not sure how, how invested Donald Trump, I'm not sure if he was a big Garrison Keillor fan to begin with. <laughs> I wasn't a huge Garrison Keillor fan either, but... Uh, but I didn't, I didn't well, hate you him. The, something you and the president have in common? I know. There's not a lot, but that, that we did. All right. I think um, maybe malka has been waiting, and then I think that'll be our last question. Sure. Rabbi Kelly's getting her steps in today. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, so I uh, watch Democracy Now!, and uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but they cover a lot of stories that you don't see on CNN, MSNBC, and the other cable news, or Fox, I assume. <laughs> um, and on the, a couple points that were made previously, one about the 24-hour news cycle, I think there's a lot, of, a lot more news that we're missing, and I'm wondering uh, what your suggestion would be for issues like the U.S.-Saudi campaign in, in Yemen, which is um, resulting in potentially the worst famine and cholera, cholera outbreak in history, and issues like that getting more coverage? Well, uh, it's, I mean, I think certainly there are issues that are not necessarily always being covered, and that's, that's always a thing. But, I mean, look, the, if, I mean, some of that may be the 24-hour news networks that, you know, 24-hour news may not be having, you know, Anderson Cooper live from Yemen, but there's been great reporting out of the New York Times, out of the Washington Post, and it's just if, I think part of the issue is that there's this conception increasingly that people have that the news is what's on TV, um, which is not, not good for anybody, that it's sort of the news is what's on TV is very different than the news in, you know, reading newspapers is, you know, is where is a far more important, far more diverse thing because TV networks can only handle, you know, so many, so many things, so many topics that you can't sort of uh, hopscotch the world for headlines. That it's sort of a couple of things that drive uh, that drive a day, move on. That it's not, in and of itself, the best form of news. It's one form of news. It's an important form of news, but print is still far more important. Well, Ben, I want to thank you for your, uh, for your time today and for your thoughtful comments. Uh, it's really such a joy to have you back on the BIMA. I know you'll be back on the BIMA before 20 years from now. Um, I do want to uh, wish you good luck tomorrow in the Ravens game. Um, I, I will actually be at the game as well, so we may, we may run into you. And I want to remind everyone that we have two more sessions in our series on Press Freedoms. Uh, the next one is January 6th, and that will be with another hometown Betham kid in Rachel Fishman Federson, who is the publisher and CEO of The Forward. So here we'll be shifting from talking to uh, journalism done by Jews to talking about Jewish journalism and this storied publication in The Forward, um, how it's changed, how it's evolved, and Rachel's assessment of its, its import 
um, uh, in the landscape of, of journalism and free journalism in this country. And then we'll take uh, February off and we'll come to our first Shabbat of March, that's March 3rd, with our own Bob Blau, who is the executive editor at Bloomberg News, and Bob's sitting here today, and he's going to kind of run the anchor leg for us, tying together what we've learned from our previous three speakers, but also someone I think will be able to speak um, to some of the questions that have come up both with David and with Ben today about funding models and about sort of the landscape of journalism and how do we move forward and, and, and reinvest in stories that need to be told or that maybe our uh, populations that are underserved, uh, as well as understanding a little bit um, about the Pulitzer Prize, because Bob, among his uh, many accomplishments, sits on the committee that awards the Pulitzer Prize. Um, so I'm, I'll be curious to hear, hear from Bob uh, what that's like, and also a little bit uh, uh, more about that. Um, everybody, it's really been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for joining us. There are these flyers uh, on your way out.